All right, yes, as Nala said, my name is Rob Clark. I also work at AG Grid, a bit of a theme. And in this talk, um, we'll be talking about how AG Grid can be used within the context of reporting applications uh, that work off large amounts of data. And in particular, we'll be focusing on the server-side role model. So I think a lot of you guys, from speaking to you earlier anyway, have already used the uh, service role model or familiar. So give us a quick show of hands of who's heard of it, first of all. It's quite a lot. And who's tried to use it? Who's successfully used it? OK. All right, OK. So that's, that, there you go. So it works. OK, so um, this talk is going to be more demo, a bit of coding. So I'm going to be kind of trapped behind my laptop here. Um, so I'm just going to kick off with some introductory kind of ideas and kind of motivations as to why we would use a server side model in the first place. Okay, so right. So let's say we, let's consider the case where we have small to medium sized data sets, and we are tasked with building a reporting application where there's around 100,000 records, let's say, in our database. So in this case, things are fairly straightforward. We can just make a single request to fetch all of the data and pass it into the grid. And better still, um, as we have all the data in the browser, we can perform all grid operations such as uh, sorting, filtering, grouping, etc., uh, inside the grid. So that's great, lots of free out of the box functionality. However, this approach is not going to work for large data sets. So let's say now we've got 1 million records. Okay, first of all, we may not even be able to serve up that amount of data. And even if we can, that's a lot to be trying to send over the network. But more importantly, our browser will crash. And it will crash as we try to deserialize the response before it even hits the grid. And of course, that's due to the hard memory limit imposed by browsers. So we're going to need to keep most of the data on the server and just fetch what's required through some form of lazy loading. And all grid operations will need to be formed on the server side against the entire data set. So in this case, like sorting, filtering, grouping, etc. So these are two very different uh, strategies. And clearly, the amount of data that we are working with uh, imposes that upon us. So to address that problem, AG Grid can be configured to use different role models. Um, and these role models differ in how data is supplied to the grid. I'm sure most of you guys are familiar with these at this stage. So if you're, like in the first case, if you're confident you can load all the data into the grid, uh, you can go ahead and use the client-side role model. This is the most commonly used. And um, like I showed earlier, uh, you benefit from all that free out-of-the-box functionality. When you do need to keep most of the data on the server side, uh, you have a choice between the infinite scrolling, viewport, and server-side role models. So the infinite scrolling role model comes with our community version of AG Grid, and it provides basic support for uh, sorting and filtering while lazy loading data as you uh, scroll up and down through the data. The viewport's a bit more of a specialized case, which is focused around uh, server-side, like pushing server updates to a viewport uh, where most of the data still resides on the server-side. And then we've got the server-side role model, which is obviously the main focus of this talk. And it builds on top of the infinite scrolling role model, but provides more complex functionality such as row grouping and pivoting. Okay. So at a very high level, uh, the server-side role model lazy loads data through requests containing metadata. And this metadata captures any sorts, filters, groups, etc., that are active inside the grid, along with the position required in the data set. Uh, and we can then pass this metadata to the server side where it can perform the corresponding operations. But at this point, it's probably best if we take a look at a quick demo, which I have to get out of this. So yeah, so using a, an Oracle database. Okay. So for this demo, I don't know if maybe some of you have seen it already. It's um, 
It's available on our guide section, and it's a reference implementation that uses uh, Java backend implemented using Spring Boot, Q Spring Boot, and um, it's connecting to an Oracle database uh, with one million records. Now, we can obviously work with much larger data sets, but I think one million records is sufficient for this demo. Okay, so, yeah, yeah. that's always good. So let's have a quick look at, the, uh, what we're at, at the report. So it's kind of a mock trading report where the first three columns uh, form a kind of a book hierarchy. And we're gonna use that to demonstrate grouping. Then we got some attributes which we can use for filtering and uh, pivoting. And then we have value columns which we'll use to test our ag functions. Okay, I'm just going to bring up the dev console in the browser, okay. so. You'll notice that I, in, we have the browser dev console, which is logging the metadata or the request, which is generated by the grid when it needs more data. And then in the bottom here, we have the server output of our Java application, which is outputting the SQL that corresponds to the metadata generated by the grid. So if I just scroll up and down through the data set, we'll see that the grid, as it gets down past another 100 rows, it's gonna request more data. And so at this point, it's, we're just populating the metadata with a start row and an end row. Um, and if you look at the SQL below, um, it, we're just doing a, a, a limit offset effectively. Okay, so now let's go ahead and perform some sorting. Okay, so now we can see that our, oops, there you go. So now we've got some, now the grid has requested, um, um, has made a request containing some sort information as well. So we can see that we have a descending sort on deal type and ascending sort on the portfolio columns. And then our server side code is then uh, used that data to uh, create an order by, uh, to, up, well, to add an order by to the SQL, okay? Uh, same kind of idea if we've got filtering okay so there's, there's a so we're going to update our where clause now with a bid type in bid sorry in buy um, okay so that's great next thing I'm going to do is just let me refresh this and uh, drag it over a bit yeah. I'm going to actually get rid of this I'm just going to drag up these this group of columns so now we've created a, a kind of a book hierarchy with three levels of grouping. And uh, you know, once again, this is all off at one million records. But I suppose the key point really here is that no matter what operation we're performing, we're just doing very small SQL queries and we're bringing back a small amount of data. So let me see if, try and find a smallish kind of group. Okay, we haven't got one. Okay, so let's say that's 15 records. So when I expanded this row group here, we just brought back 15 records. That's all that last bit of SQL did. Um, so it's not imposing a heavy load on the server side, and in the browser, um, we're sending around small amounts of data, and we're just um, sh uh, showing in the viewport what we need. Okay, so let me just skip over now, and let me close this out. Uh, you'll notice that in our value columns, uh, we're not aggregating up the hierarchy levels. So that'd be nice to do. So let's quickly demonstrate that. So I'm going to create some ag functions, and by default, some will be used. So now, um, for our row grouping, we can see that it's aggregating up the hierarchy using sum. And of course, we can change these. Uh, last thing I just want to demonstrate, because this is just a quick kind of demo to give you a feel for what it does, is uh, demonstrate pivoting. And for those who are not familiar with pivoting, it's where we can convert uh, the uh, data values into effectively into columns. So if you take deal type and bid, for example, um, we can kind of create columns um, using physical and financial for deal type and bid and buy and sell for bid. So let me enter pivot mode. And because we have a lot of, because we're gonna be generating more columns, I'm going to just select current and previous for now to make it a little bit easier to see. 
Okay, so now if I pivot on deal type, whoops, if I drag it up, now we can see current and previous are broken out by financial and physical. And I can also, I can pivot as many times as I want. Uh, so I'm also going to use bid. So here we've kind of effectively kind of generated more columns um, in the grid. And we still obviously have our row grouping. So, so yes, yeah, so I mean, that is a very kind of powerful report. And it is, it, it, you know, you can embed this inside your application. Um, whereas once before, you might have had to use a standard BI tool. Uh, so, and with this, you also get the benefit of being able to fully customize it how you wish. OK, so let me um, jump back into the slides real quick. So yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm not sure if I said this ahead of time, but um, I'm going to race through this uh, presentation. Um, and the next part I'm going to do is a kind of a coding demonstration. And then at the end of it, I'm going to save a fair bit of time for questions, because I know there's going to be a few questions at the end. So I think that's the best way to do it. OK, so this, um, so yeah, so that demo is already available on our website. I'm sure some of you guys have seen that already. Um, you can just see it on the guide section. Uh, so, yeah, uh, using Java and Oracle. We have a few of the guides up there. And there's a few more coming shortly. Uh, so you've got access to the source code. And the guide really does go through and document all the installation and implementation details of both the client and, more importantly, the server in this case, because we're doing server-side operations. OK, so before I jump into the coding demo, I'm just going to introduce some interfaces that we'll be working with. So the server-side role model requires us to implement a data source, uh, which contains a single method get rows. So when the grid needs more data, it will invoke the get rows method with a params object. Uh, this params object contains the request, which is what we saw in the dev console a moment ago, along with two callbacks. Um, one if we get a happy response, and one if something goes wrong. And once again, here is the, uh, the metadata that we saw in the console. So, and it contains a range of rows to bring back, the sort and filter info, the columns we're grouping on, as, as well as the expanded group keys, value columns which contain our ag functions, as well as pivot columns and a flag indicating if we're currently pivoting in the grid or not. OK, so for this coding demo, I am going with a simple stack and hopefully a very familiar stack. We're using Node and Express. And we're sticking with SQL. In this case, we're using a MySQL database. So the idea is that uh, you know, SQL is, should be quite familiar to everyone here. And it's kind of easy to see how it kind of gets built up. Um, so let me do that now. Yep, this is it. OK. Uh, using the arm. Right, so um, as you can see here, we're importing AG Grid, the enterprise version, of course, since we're using a server side role model, along with Express and the MySQL packages. OK, so our client code just right now, just consists of this single file. Um, it contains some grid options with column defs, and it's configured to use the server-side role model. And as we're using the server-side role model, we also need to define a data source, which I just showed you the interface to. Uh, we'll go through this in a moment. And then, of course, we need to register that data source with the grid, and we do that using the set server-side data source. OK, uh, the server-side. Uh, just Node Express, and we've exposed a single endpoint called Olympic Winners, which delegates requests to this service, Olympic Winner Service. So this is this code contains all of our application logic, if you like, for the server side. I'll just quickly kind of show you uh, the, the, the get data request. Um, so the get data takes the request, builds uh, a SQL string, which it then uses to query against the MySQL database, and then it returns the results back. But the interesting part is the 
SQL generation, because that's really what we're doing on the server side here. So right now we're just doing a kind of a select star from table kind of thing with a limit. Um, so if I go back to our, let me just show you where we are. So this is our starting point of our app. So it's the, the ubiquitous Olympic medals data. If anyone has been looking at our docs, I'm sure you're sick of looking at this data. Uh, but it is very intuitive. Um, so I think it's a, it's a good uh, starting point. Um, so right now the grid doesn't have any functionality in it. Uh, it just shows um, a flat data set. So we're going to go into the uh, so we're going to go into the client side code and just kind of update this. Before I do, I'm just going to uh, go back and explain the implementation of the server side data source. So a key point here um, is that you can redo anything you want in here, okay? Uh, but of course, the params object contains the request, the metadata, and it contains the callback methods. So regardless of how you what you're querying and how you're doing it. You can just take that metadata, you can transform it, you can use any kind of server-side technology or collection of services or whatever you want. Um, so it's completely agnostic in terms of the server-side technologies that you may be using. Um, and then whenever you get your data back, so obviously in this case we're just doing a simple post uh, and just passing the metadata as is or the request as is. And our server side is coded to understand that request. And when it returns back a response, a happy response, we call the success callback. Um, otherwise, we invoke the fail callback to notify the grid something went wrong. <coughs> uh, just note here that the last row, uh, that's used. So initially, you won't know what the last row is. Um, but once you scroll down to the very end of your data set, you will know. Uh, and it's good to pass in, well, it's kind of important to pass in the, the actual last row index so that the scroll is uh, set correctly. Okay? So, yeah, it's a very simple data source, not much going on here, and we just register it with the grid. Okay, so I'll just kind of demonstrate kind of what, what that's actually currently doing. Does that look okay? Yeah. So, just like before, we have our metadata. I'll just make this a little bit bigger. Can I? Okay, so as I scroll through the data set, you can see the SQL in the bottom. We're just doing select from table, or select star from table, uh, with some limit offsets, okay? But our grid doesn't do anything at this point. It doesn't do, there's no sorting, there's no filtering. Clearly, there's no grouping or anything, or aggregations happening. So let's go ahead and implement that. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is enable sorting. I think that's the easiest feature to implement first. So if I go ahead and enable sorting in the client, update. Okay, so we can see that the grid is requesting more data, and we can see that the sort, uh, sort metadata in the request, but this isn't sorting. And of course, that's because our server side um, isn't expecting it yet. It hasn't been implemented yet. So if we go back into the server-side code, yes, it's going to be an order by clause. So we're just doing simple string manipulation here, but we're building up the order by clause using the sort model that we've provided. Nothing fancy on purpose. So now when we go back into the grid and we do some sorting, we can see our server-side code is, uh, now includes an order by clause and is sorting correctly. Okay, so I'll just quickly step through the next one, which is filtering. And for this case, I will add a very simple number filter to one column. Okay. Um, so, Let's do greater than or equals to 2010. Okay, so um, we can see our filter model in the metadata, and we can see in the where clause we have year greater than or equal to 20, 2010. And the SQL is, once again, straightforward stuff. Um, it's just a switch statement, which is just mapping the, um, the filter names the appropriate expression. 
Okay, very basic stuff on purpose, as I said. Um, okay, let's do something a little bit more interesting because I know this isn't as of yet riveting you. I'll uh, I'll add some. I'll add to do some grouping. How about that? So yay, we have grouping, but that doesn't look right, does it? And yes, we have no group by clause mass SQL. So I will, by uncommenting some code, magically make that work. Okay. And I'll just kind of step in and show you once again. We're just using the uh, group columns and the group keys to determine what the group uh, by clause should be. So now when we go in, still updating in the background, update, is it done? Okay, so great. So now we've got row grouping. So this is all, I mean, you can kind of see there's a bit of a theme developing here. So uh, I'll add one more row group. And this is the last kind of, well, the second last kind of feature I'll add before I move on to something else. Uh, so yes, we have two levels of grouping. As you can see, that was easy to configure. Um, I'm assuming that you guys are pretty much already familiar with the basic grid options, so I'm kind of skipping over some of that stuff. Um, okay, so what if you want to add some, uh, if you want to aggregate up the hierarchy? Well, the simplest way in my simplest possible example I could come up with would be to just uh, add some ag functions. And I'll just hard code it to be some uh, to each of the value columns or our metal columns. So, so there we have it. Um, I think that's probably the simplest implementation that uh, we could really do. Kind of simple data set, no kind of fancy uh, configs or customizations here. But yet we have, you know, I mean, this is kind of a relatively small data set. But uh, obviously, the, the, this application that we've, we've developed together, as it were, uh, can handle any amount of data, assuming your server can handle it. Um, so pretty powerful and, and pretty straightforward, I would argue. Okay, so the last thing I want to do before I kind of open up for some questions um, is just kind of go through some of the configurations, okay? And to do that, I'm going to just kind of show you some pictures. Um, okay. So at the heart of service I role model uh, is a cache, which contains blocks, and blocks contain rows. Uh, each metadata request that we saw logged in that dev console actually is a request for a block, a block of rows. Um, it's also maybe not obvious to people uh, when they start, first start using the service I role model that e each level, each kind of group level, has its own separate cache. So that red line there kind of highlights that. Um, and in fact, it's, it's a, re a recursive data structure, really, because if you start at the very top root node of the cache, sorry, of, of the grid, that contains a cache, and then that contains blocks, which contains rows, which contains, you know, et cetera, all the way down. So it's a, kind of a complex uh, data structure, but as application developers, you don't need to know anything really about that. Um, but it is useful to know um, because we do express the configuration in terms of this cache and blocks. So it is um, good to at least have some kind of very high level idea of um, how the data is, is, is um, managed in the client. And I just want to make the point as well that this, is not, this doesn't conflict in any way with row virtualization, which Niall spoke about earlier, row and column virtualization. So um, row virtualization, again, is about uh, ensuring that only visible elements in the grid, in the viewport, are actually in the DOM. This is actually just about managing the actual data uh, in the client. Okay, so, um, whoops. Okay, so I'm just going to pick out two configuration options, uh, cache block size and max blocks in cache. So cache block size obviously determines how many rows are in a block. Um, if you have a s small configuration for this, 
uh, you'll be obviously bringing back a smaller payload, but you'll be making more requests to your server, so be more chatty. So kind of a, a classic um, kind of trade-off situation. The max blocks and cache is a way to kind of help manage the memory footprint. So I'll demonstrate this with a slightly unrealistic setting of two. So let's say we already have two blocks loaded in the cache, and we scroll down to, to uh, obtain a third block of rows. Um, the first block will be automatically purged. So that's kind of a nice way to, to help manage the, um, the memory footprint, as I say. So I'm going to jump back into the demo and just continue with some of these options. And when you're testing, when you're working with the server-side role model, it is actually quite useful to use the uh, debug mode. There is some good stuff there. So I'm going to put this at the bottom. Uh, I'm going to make it full screen. We don't need the server output for this bit. And I'm going to, what do we want? Print cache. Okay, so I'm just going to filter the log so that we're just looking at uh, the cache, okay? The cache status. Oh, one last thing I'm going to do is just, I'm going to remove the row groups. Uh, it's better to have, for this demo, it's better to have um, a flat list. Just, it's easier to, to see the blocks. Um, so, sorry, maybe I'll just highlight it again in case you guys missed it. So what I've done here is I've set the max blocks in cache to, th to the value three. So obviously we're only ever gonna have three blocks in any given cache. And um, we're gonna bring back 20 rows at a time as opposed to the default of 100. So as I scroll down through the grid, you'll notice that the, the logging here is being updated and that corresponds to the cache. So let me bring this down. So we can see that the cache remains fixed at size three, uh, even though the block numbers and the range, row ranges are being updated. And you may also notice there's a page status or block status. Um, so initially, when the grid determines it needs new data, it will um, create a block, an empty block, and it will be in a dirty state. When the grid invokes the get rows method, it will um, put the block into a loading state. And then once the data source has returned the data to the grid, it is loaded. And there's also a fail state as well. So this is just kind of stuff to kind of keep in mind when you're working with this. Uh, it can help if you're ever debugging any kind of server side issues. Um, okay, um, the next thing I'm gonna do is, well actually I think I'm running a little bit short of time, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna uh, mention these, just highlight these, uh, these options. So uh, some other interesting properties that we have that we can use, uh, purge closed row nodes. So uh, as, you, as you collapse groups, that will uh, destroy or will purge all the caches uh, below. Um, the, also you can load blocks in parallel concurrently. Um, so you can, and you can constrain how many concurrent requests you can use for that. Uh, we also have a fairly new property called, uh, well, block load debounce. And that's useful if you want to skip over a load of blocks to, without having to kind of load all the uh, intermediate blocks. Um, so so that's, that's another kind of useful one. There are more, um, and uh, we'll be putting, maybe do a bit more work on the documentation around some of this stuff as well. So at least I will anyway. Okay, so let me just crack on. Um, Okay, so um, this is kind of fictitious, doesn't exist yet. Um, there will be, so this, this source code uh, with an associated guide uh, will be on our website shortly. Um, and obviously there'll be GitHub links so you can kind of use this as a starting point to experiment. And that's probably something we should have done a while ago really because, um, and you can, you can only really get so much out of the examples that we have because they are obviously, not, there's no real server there. So I think, uh, and this, we did start with some of the more complex use cases, like I don't know if you can see on the links there, like Oracle <laughs> and Spark, because a lot of uh, the kind of early adopters of this were kind of um, were obviously banks and people with very complex use cases. So we were kind of supporting those users initially, but um, but now we're kind of we're getting back to the to a kind of a, a larger group of people uh, with these kind of more simple uh, demos. Also, there's a GraphQL one there as well, which uh, I know through support 
a number of people have asked us, you know, how could you get that to work with uh, GraphQL? Uh, that's a really fascinating read. So uh, go ahead and uh, check that one out. Um, so okay, so that okay, that's it for the demo. Um, hopefully, I managed to demonstrate to you that it's fairly straightforward to build powerful reports that work off large data sets using the server-side role model. Um, and yeah, thanks for listening. And I think we'll have some questions.